Based on what we believe to be overwhelming and clear evidence, the Commission of Inquiry has indicted the Bush administration for war crimes and crimes against humanity for its invasion and occupation of Iraq. Count one. The Bush administration's invasion of Iraq was an illegal war of aggression, predicated on deception, and was in direct contravention of the United Nations Charter, the Geneva Conventions, and the Nuremberg Principles, all of which repudiate war under any circumstances other than self-defense. Our charge is that this war is illegal, immoral, and unjust, and I think that to un understand how deeply unjust this war is, we have to examine the politics and the goals of this war. The United States government never intended to disarm Iraq because a disarmed Iraq was counterproductive to a policy of regime change because if Iraq was disarmed, sanctions would have to be lifted. The United States needed to maintain the perception of a non-compliant Iraq even though it possessed the definitive data that proved Iraq was complying with its obligation to disarm. Although this took place during the Clinton administration, this data set was transferred in its entirety to the Bush administration, and the Bush administration knew that Iraq posed no threat to the United States of America that warranted any form of military action. The problem the United States faced in Iraq was that Saddam Hussein's continued rule and to one degree or another defiance of the U.S. was eroding U.S. credibility in the region. Number two, it was giving rise to enormous anger at the suffering and destruction of Iraq and the murder of civilians through sanctions. Number three, the U.S. policy of sanctions was unraveling and if it had collapsed, it would have been a major defeat for the United States. And finally, this situation was opening up opportunities for other great powers, for example, France and Russia, to strengthen their hand in Iraq, which is a, a key country at the center of the Middle East, second largest oil reserves in the world. The administration has said that the French, the Germans, the Russians, indeed the entire world felt that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. I can tell you as the person who was responsible for some of the most sensitive intelligence operations run by the United Nations vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and its weapons of mass destruction program, the person who had total access to every shred of intelligence data provided by the international community to the United Nations regarding Iraq's weapons of mass destruction that while there may have been uncertainty about the final disposition of the totality of Iraq's WMD programs, the entire world, including the CIA, acknowledged that the United Nations weapons inspectors had, by 1998, accounted for 95 to 98 percent of Iraq's declared stockpiles, that there was uncertainty regarding the final disposition of this 5 to 2 percent that could not be absolutely verified, but there was no nation, and I'll say that again, no nation, including the United States, that had any hard factual data to sustain the argument that Iraq, A, retained weapons of mass destruction, or B, was actively reconstituting weapons of mass destruction. So I will contradict the Bush administration by stating no nation supported the Bush administration's contention that Iraq maintained viable, massive stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction at any time from 1998 up until the eve of the invasion in March of 2003. What caused the Bush administration to change its stated assessment is the policy decision undertaken by the Bush administration to remove the regime of Saddam Hussein from power. Around this policy, the Bush administration fixed intelligence, including analysis that it claims was the result of a re-examination of the facts in light of the events of September 11, 2001, namely that because of the terrorist attacks against the United States on that date, the United States could no longer tolerate an uncertain 
situation in Iraq. And the reason why I highlight this is that the Bush administration, in making these statements, acknowledges the uncertainty that exists regarding WMD. This is a far cry from the statements made by the President, indeed members of his administration, under oath to the Congress of the United States that they knew these weapons indeed existed. On March 18th, 2003, President Bush sent to Congress a one-page letter and a nine-page report claiming that Iraq had biological and chemical weapons, uh, making progress toward nuclear weapons, and ties to Al-Qaeda. That was a pair of lies, and it is a felony to lie to Congress. We know from independent reporting that Bush had a war with Iraq in mind even prior to his first term in office, as did the Project for a New American Century. Bush Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill says Bush was planning war and regime change in January 01. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was reported as planning an attack on Iraq just hours after the September 11th airplanes hit. National Sec Security official Richard Clark says Bush told him on September 12th to find reasons to attack Iraq. When Bush and Blair were asked about the Downing Street minutes last summer, their main response was that after the meeting, recorded in the minutes, they had gone to the UN in an effort to avoid war. But the evidence is clear that going to the UN was an attempt to legalize a war that had already been decided upon. When this failed, when an avenue to avoid war opened up in the form of new inspections, and when the UN refused to authorize the war, Bush and Blair launched the war anyway. <laughs> The illegal war against Iraq is a specific application of the Bush Doctrine, one that, in addition to the terrible consequences for Iraq, threatens to have far broader consequences for the entire Earth. It is a doctrine through which the American Empire attempts to establish a new world order based on the fantasy of absolute security for itself and disregard, domination, insecurity, and destruction for others. So I think it is important for us to think about the idea that it is not mere lawlessness then that lies at the core of the actions that have been undertaken by the US government, but something much more threatening. It is an attempt to establish a law that will now rule the globe, an empire's law, that is a form of unilaterally constituted and imposed, illegitimate, unaccountable rule by a global power that attempts to perform the role of a global sovereign declaring itself to be able to set the exception. And this has deeply draconian implications for the future of war, as much as it does for the future of legality. Count two. The Bush administration authorized conduct of the war that involved the commission of war crimes, including the targeting of civilians, attacks on vital infrastructure, the use of disproportionate force, and the deployment of weapons with indiscriminate effects. The broad charge against the Bush administration in Iraq is that their conduct, their deployment of military force, and their treatment of civilians and prisoners has been excessive and indiscriminate. This is in violation of the laws of war and the Geneva Conventions. For example, targeting by snipers of children and other civilians targeting of ambulances, placement of snipers on the roofs of hospitals, and prevention of civilians from getting there for medical attention, and also illegal weapons used. Uh, during the invasion in March 2003, in April 2003, uh, which essentially came through southern Iraq and up through central Iraq, uh, through heavily populated areas, there was extensive use of depleted uranium weapons uh, in and near uh, towns and cities. The use of weapons uh, that release into the environment um, material that is so toxic and so concentrated and so readily um, respirable is is profoundly uh, reckless uh, to 
conservative. And uh, this can be said of uh, the uranium oxide dust from, from DU weapons. It's inherently toxic. That's been known for more than a century. It's, in, it, it, it's uh, intrinsically indiscriminate. It affects soldiers on both sides as well as civilians. It damages the environment persist on the battlefield, it cannot be turned off when the war is over, it's not confined to the field of battle and causes superfluous injury. Uh, because of these features, the United Nations Subcommittee on the Pro Promotion and Protection of Human Rights has consistently ruled that depleted uranium weapons are incompatible with existing international humanitarian and human rights laws. Count three. The Bush administration authorized the occupation of Iraq, which has involved the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity, including assassinations, unlawful attacks, summary executions, kidnapping, torture, collective punishment, and a persistent violation of the collective right to self-determination. It's a bit difficult to stand up here as a soldier and talk about what's legal or illegal in the war because, quite frankly, we received no training. However, from personal experience, and because I do have a conscience, I will tell what I perceived while I was in Iraq to be legal, and if not illegal, morally wrong. I remember one time we employed our entire company to raid a group of homes that were in this pretty elegant neighborhood in our Mahdi were looking for a, a member of the Ba'ath Party. And the intelligence that we were acting on was five foot seven, skinny, and dark hair. And this happened a lot, actually. We knew, for instance, that a lot of times the people would have a, like family quarrels and things like that, and uh, they would tell us you know, how their, their neighbors or you know, who turned out to be their cousins or something like that were, were making bombs or that they were uh, planting these bombs or that they were conducting attacks, insurgency attacks. And we would, we would act upon that to raid an entire, an enti the entire block of a neighborhood only to realize that there was nothing in the house, and then what we would do, or what the commander would do, he would publicly um, tell on the person who gave the information, and God knows what, happens, what happened to that person after that. There are many other things. I, I, could, I could stand here for hours and just go on and on about everything that I saw that was wrong, but I think that the main thing that creates violence in Iraq is that there's a sense from the Iraqi people that we are there to stay permanently and to occupy and oppress them, occupy and oppress their land, and that they are resisting that occupation. It doesn't matter if, if, if we have good feelings or we're acting out of fear or we're acting out of frustration, the fact is that we have no right to be there and they realize that. The U.S. military, again following orders from their commander-in-chief, declared the entire city of Fallujah, a city with a population of over 350,000 civilians, a free fire zone, meaning once that operation began in November of 2004, anything in the city was to be targeted by the U.S. military. Approximately 70% of the entire city of Fallujah was bombed to the ground during the U.S. assault on that city in November of 2004, which left dead a, a, estimates of between four and 6,000 civilians. Water, food, and medical aid were cut off from Fallujah both before and during the siege of that city. The first thing U.S. forces did was cut off the water supply, a war crime. For over a month since then, women and their families were trapped in their houses by curfews and U.S. snipers without food, water, medical care, or electricity. U.S. forces have left Fallujah's families to face this scourge without providing electricity, sewage, or other necessary services, also a war crime. Independent journalists who have tried to cover Fallujah have been detained and shot at by U.S. forces, which is, of course, also a war crime. A U.S. order 
issued in March 2004 gave the U.S. installed Iraqi government sweeping powers to control the media. U.S. installed Prime Minister Alawi in November of 2004 issued a letter telling the news media to quote, stick to the government line on the U.S.-led offensive in Fallujah or face legal action. No administration in the history of this country has waged a bloodier war on journalists and journalism than the current administration. Some 60 journalists have been killed in Iraq since the launch of the so-called War on Terror. More than 20 other individuals classified as media workers, drivers, translators, fixers, have also been killed. Some of the incidents are classified as ongoing investigations. Most of them have been labeled either self-defense or mistakes. Some are even classified as justified. And I, I say that with quotes. Among the justified killings of journalists was the gunning down of Reuters cameraman Mazendana. He was shot near the Abu Ghraib prison when his camera was allegedly mistaken for a rocket-propelled grenade launcher. Also justified, and I use that in quotes as well, was the killing of Al Arabiya TV's Mazen Al Tumaizi. He was literally blown apart, and his camera captured the horrifying explosion of his abdomen. One of the main purposes of the original Geneva Conventions was to protect medical facilities and personnel. The takeover of Fallujah General Hospital on the 7th of November is the prime example of. of this breach. According to the military, the hospital was targeted because it was a, quote, center of propaganda that spread rumors of civilian casualties during, last, during April of, the April 04 siege. During the siege, patients were rounded up in order to lie on the floor with their hands tied behind their backs, as were doctors, another war crime. Two days later, the U.S. bombed Fallujah's Central Health Center, another war crime, killing 20 nurses and doctors and an uncounted number of patients. The U.S. military has refused to allow emergency aid to be brought into Fallujah, both during and after the siege, a war crime. The U.S. has also re refused to allow doctors to evacuate wounded people to hospitals outside the city, also a war crime. The U.S. has deliberately targeted ambulances and medical personnel in combat zones across Iraq, of course, also a war crime as well. Attacks on civilian hospitals are grave breaches under Article 147 of the Fort Geneva Convention of 1949. An attack on a military hospital is also a grave breach of the provisions of Geneva Convention 1. The Bush administration has openly defied the Geneva Conventions and continues to do so with no statements of remorse. Deliberately targeting civilians, the denial of food, water, and medical care to the civilian population as a method of warfare is, of course, a war crime. Military forces may not starve out civilians. Military forces may not deny food, water, medicine, or relief actions. The original purpose of the Geneva Conventions was on these points. This form of collective punishment, which I've seen firsthand in Ramadi and Samara as well, has even led the UN to declare in October of last year that this was, quote, a flagrant, flagrant violation of international law. Either in part or in full, these policies have been utilized in the cities of Ramadi, Samara, Haditha, Fallujah, Al Qaim, Balad, Abu Hishma, Sania, Najaf, Kut, Baghdad, Mosul, to name some. The whole time that I was in Iraq, I can say that I was very afraid and that I was very frustrated that I acted more upon my own fear of being killed and out of my will to survive than out of any sense of humanity or solidarity with the Iraqi people. But at no time, even though by the circumstances we were enemies with some of them, did I feel that they hated me as a human being. I knew that they hated the occupation. I knew that they hated that the army was in their land. But whenever there was room for dialogue, there was dialogue. Whenever there was room for 
smoking a cigarette and, and drinking tea. We smoked cigarettes and drank tea. And at one point, I remember that this, this person that we used to do a lot of work with, uh, he was the manager of a propane station. Uh, he even shared the Quran with me. And he said that usually you would have to wash your whole body, but given the circumstances, you just wash your hands and then you can touch the Quran and you can read it. It is my duty as a Muslim to allow you to learn about the Quran. Whenever people are willing to listen, we have an obligation to talk as good Muslims. When I surrender back to the military, um, there were about 500 cases of desertion in the military. People who, for one reason or another, were deciding that they were going to put their weapon down and they were not going to go back to the war. When I got out of jail, some nine months later, that number had jumped up to about 6,000. The horror that is the United States illegal war against Iraq illuminates the reason that wars of aggression were called at the Nuremberg Tribunal, which I think it is important to recall was largely a creature of the United States, the supreme international crime. The Nuremberg judgment famously held, and I quote, that to initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. In the wake of the devastation of World War II, sovereign states formally agreed to give up their right to go to war with the introduction of the UN Charter. And yet, the United States government, along with its coalition of the willing, has flagrantly breached international law. It has done so in terms of the war that it launched against Iraq, a war that amounts to aggressive war, and also in terms of the means that it has chosen to deploy in Iraq, means of warfare that amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The illegality of the war itself has been recognized by the Secretary General of the United Nations, the International Commission of Jurists, and the great preponderance of serious legal and political commentators across the world. The means that have been deployed in Iraq have also been widely recognized to amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is therefore now crucial that international legality be reasserted, that the crimes perpetrated against the Iraqi people be formally investigated and that the perpetrators of these crimes be held legally responsible by in being indicted for these crimes.